Now beyond what I've just shared with you, that show that uh, there's a lot more to the Spanish flu that we aren't being told about, right? I'm going to explain five reasons why comparing the 1918 Spanish flu to the 2019-2020 COVID-19 is just, it's completely ridiculous, guys. It's rooted in propaganda. The first is that most, de most deaths during the 1918 flu, the Spanish flu, were actually attributed to a secondary infection of pneumonia. How many media outlets have actually told you about this? I'm going to get into that. And then today, what people are noting, experts are noting, is that it's pre-existing conditions. Those are the people that are mostly dying. So over here, you see, for example, a number of studies have ascertained this already. You can look into it. All you have to do, guys, like I said, where I have a publication or a study that's showing uh, the headline, you can look it up yourself. I'm not going to link that. That's going to take me forever. It's unnecessary. And as you can see over here, what really happened during the 1918 influenza pandemic? The importance of bacterial secondary infections. And you know, the study bacterial pneumonia was the main killer in the 1918 flu pandemic. This is a big deal, right? Unless they are providing this context and explaining it to us, the media, then they are misleading us, right? Of course. This is a, of course you should mention that really, you know, during the Spanish flu, the reason why so many people died was actually a secondary infection of pneumonia. Oh, really? Wow. That gives me a lot more context. Instead, they just say, oh, this killer virus came running through the wall and just killed everybody. And now that's similar to COVID-19 somehow. And it's most certainly not. And then, as I said, correspondingly, to show how polarized, how polar opposite back then is compared to now, most people are dying now with pre-existing conditions. So on the one end, right, with the so-called Spanish flu, the pre-existing condition was the 1918 influenza, and then a secondary infection of, back, of pneumonia came along, and that's been attributed with the high deaths. Well, now we have pre-existing conditions, a number, one, two, sometimes three. So these are two totally different examples, and it's inappropriate to compare those two, obviously. Yeah, we've got nearly 99% of Minnesota deaths were patients with underlying conditions. And yeah, also 9 in 10 dying had existing conditions. And like I said earlier with this guy, the legendary coroner, in Germany, where he explained that, you know, COVID-19 is a comparatively harmless viral disease. And according to him, the fatalities he examined had such serious previous illnesses that, and I quote, even if it's not hard, everyone would have died in the course of this year, whether they had COVID-19 or not, guys. Okay, what's the second thing that just shows how ridiculous these comparisons are? The age demographics. That's a big deal, guys. In the 1918 flu, it was mostly young people under 65. Mostly young people under 65, whereas now it's over 65. Again, polar opposites. I mean, it's ridiculous to make these comparisons. So you can see in the study of the threat of pandemic influenza, in the 1918 pandemic, most deaths occurred among young adults. Persons less than 65 years old accounted for more than 99% of all excess influenza related deaths in 1918-1919. Whereas now what we are finding is over 65s account for 90% of coronavirus deaths recorded in Ireland for example. And similar findings in other parts of the world, there's more than 90% are over the age of 60 in Canada. So it's ridiculous to make these comparisons. It's a fear mongering tactic guys. To make this association, this outrageous association, it's a form of propaganda and classical conditioning. Third thing, the reliability of the death reports. Once again, we have totally different scenarios. So in the first case with the 1918 flu, this was actually censored by governments. People don't realize that. It was censored by governments in most countries who were in World War I at the time, which is also a significant factor that's being overlooked. I'm going to get into that. And then today, based on expert testimony, which I've already shared with you, it's potentially being inflated by multiple governments. So we take a look over here, and this is just an interesting piece of information for people who like to learn. I know there's a rare breed out there, but if you like to learn, yeah, what you find is the term Spanish flu was a misnomer because the disease did not actually originate in Spain, guys. The disease was rampant in Germany, Britain, France, and the United States, but wartime censors minimized the early reports of illness and mortality in these countries. During the 1918 flu pandemic, Spain's king, Alfonso XIII, he actually became very ill 
And his illness and recovery from the disease was reported to the world because Spain was neutral and was not under wartime censorship restrictions, while outbreaks of flu in other belligerent countries were concealed and covered up. This created the wrong impression that Spain was most affected and caused the pandemic to be dubbed as the Spanish flu. Okay, and this is a good article that you just want to verify what I'm saying from an authoritative source, history.com. As the 1918 flu emerged, cover up and denial helped it spread. So they could have prevented a lot of diseases and deaths from taking place, but they covered it up, guys. That's significant to know, right? And as you can see, uh, they explain that the wartime censorship was more entrenched in European countries because Europe had been fighting since 1914, while the United States had only entered the war in 1917. But the truth of the matter is that the propaganda was prolific, or just everywhere, okay? It was going on in the United States even before they entered the war. You look at an organization in the United Kingdom, for example, Wellington House, where they had the most respected authors, celebrities working for them, such as the writer of Sherlock Holmes, for example. He was involved with them. And then in the United States, they had the Committee on Public Information, also known as the Creole Committee. And when you see how far reaching their impact was, how sophisticated their propaganda was, it will help put into context and perspective why we need to always maintain vigilance and why we always have to question these governments. Right? Question, what are they up to? I mean, back then, they used what we now recognize as Hollywood. A lot of people don't realize the foundation of Hollywood and the film industry, a lot of that was largely rooted in government propaganda. They were found to be very useful in that particular context. They also had this campaign called the 4-Minute Men where they used celebrities like Charlie Chaplin to get everybody all excited and involved in the war. And, and later on, Charlie Chaplin would, would become a bit more disillusioned. And that's another story for another day. And they would also even use scientists. Like, you know, we have Charles Edward Merriam. He was a political scientist. And to help you understand how the, the, their propaganda works and how dangerous they can be and why you should always question the narrative, guys. This over here, this political cartoon, which was commissioned by the Committee on Public Information, which was the propaganda office of the U.S. government. This political artwork, which you can find in the Library of Congress, is the URL. You can go look it up for yourself. You can go fact check it. As you can see at the bottom there, what does it say? It says, the enemy's liar at work. Don't help him. So that's the message they want to broadcast to people. Well, if we take a closer look at what the so-called enemy's liar is writing, what do we see over here? Sickness spreads in camps. What they are talking about, guys, is the Spanish flu, what we recognize today to be the most deadly pandemic in human history. Over here, they were trying to trivialize it. They were trying to suggest that there's nothing going on. It's just rumors. There were probably some smaller media outlets, those crazy conspiracy theorists, that were talking about the strange sickness that was spreading in the military camps because that's where the Spanish flu began to spread before hitting the United States population. And in this, what do they say? No, this is the enemy's liar at work. Don't help him. Do you understand how dodgy and dangerous that is? So now in hindsight, historically speaking, we have the privilege to be able to look back and see that, wow, not only did they cover up the fact that the Spanish flu was being proliferated and spreading, but they did it through very, very dodgy, surreptitious means of propaganda. I mean, this is just disgusting. And there's no reason why we should not believe similar methodologies not being used today. So essentially they were covering it up and just once again highlighting how polar opposite it is. Because that's not the case. Yeah, yeah, we have, as Michael Levitt said, people seem, governments seem to be racing to see who can have the most COVID-19 deaths. Totally different scenario. And then over here, also like I mentioned earlier, I mean, Deborah Burks, obviously not a fan of her, but just to explain, because she's considered a figure of authority where she herself believes that the CDC may be inflating coronavirus statistics like death rates and case numbers. So it's just totally ridiculous to make this comparison between the Spanish flu back then and today with the coronavirus. We have two total opposite happenings here where on the one side they completely suppressed the information about how many deaths there were and now they are potentially inflating them. I was the fourth thing, the historical context. This is so important, guys. That's why these ridiculous, oversimplified explanations that are given to us by the media, especially about something from like a hundred years ago, 
you right away you need to know okay there must be is there something more to this this is investigative journalism 101 what's the context what else could what are the other factors well this was during world war one world war one at that time was the most traumatizing event globally collectively for people in history right it was malnutrition because people were low on food supplies so they had to ration food Obviously, if you're not getting the appropriate nutrition, you're more susceptible and likely to getting sick. There were unsanitary conditions. There was also poor healthcare systems. Whereas today, we don't have this huge global war for the first time in history. I mean, that was the, that's World War I, right? It was unprecedented. And that means it's also unprecedented in terms of the psychological stress. And, and don't get me wrong, there's a huge amount of stress going on now too because it's being imposed and created artificially. By the authorities it's not necessary to react this way and then oh yeah we you know we have significantly improved healthcare systems and conditions as well guys so again world war one that's a big deal that needs to be taken into consideration and then the other thing is this was just coming out and not even entirely coming out but of the age of imperialism and this was brutal right it created rife conditions for people to get sick when people are suffering or they're at war or whatever your immune system is compromised because you're unhappy. I've already shown you very clearly, guys. Stress and well-being are deeply connected, right? If you are chronically stressed, then your immune system is chronically compromised. And yeah, they showed in this published study, remember the professor I told you about earlier, he was a former director at the World Health Organization. He was very vocal against the 2009 pandemic that was declared and the conflicts of interest of big, big pharmaceutical companies, once again by... Neil Ferguson in Imperial College London, which is outrageous. I mean, you would think that they would have the creativity to use a different group. It's just, it's like a bad movie script. And over here, they document that stricken by war and hunger, poor, frail, and undernourished people paid the highest death toll. That's key to understand, guys. If you're already in a position where your immune system is obviously compromised because you don't have the appropriate nutrition, you're living in unsanitary conditions, you're impoverished, Unfortunately, you have a higher likelihood that you're going to die. It's not just that the Spanish flu is coming or COVID-19 is coming and it's so deadly. There's other factors that we need to consider. And then they explain, mortality figures from the Spanish flu showed a 31-fold variability according to the nutritional and social status of the respective populations. In a hypothetical reoccurrence of the Spanish influenza pandemic, 96% of all deaths would occur in the developing countries and only 4% in the developed world. And that clearly is not what's going on here today, right? Most of the deaths that have been allegedly attributed to COVID-19 are happening in the so-called developed world. Again, totally different scenario and completely ridiculous comparisons. Now, even on Wikipedia, guys, which as manipulated as Wikipedia is, you can even see on there where it explains a 2007 analysis of medical journals from this period of the pandemic found that the viral infection was no more aggressive than previous influenza strains. So we're being totally misled again, right? Taken out of context. Instead, malnourishment, overcrowded medical camps, and hospitals, and poor hygiene, all exacerbated by the recent war, this promoted bacterial superinfection, which was the secondary infection of the pneumonia that I told you about. This context is so important to keep in mind. And then if you look into history itself, what you'll find is there is such a close relationship, guys, with major outbreaks of disease and war. And this needs to be considered, okay? It needs to be considered. The Hundred Years' War, for example, this gave a break to the bubonic plague, right? Or the Black Death. And then, in addition to that, what we find, if you look at this study, by Sharon DeWitts and James Wood, is that, again, even in this particular instance, it, had, it was selective in that it was going with people or going after people. I mean, I don't want to talk about it like it's a big boogeyman, but it was killing people that had compromised immune systems. That's how disease works, guys. Try not to give in to all of the stress because then you are setting yourself up to become sick. Don't give in to the fear-mongering. Don't give in to the illusion. All right? Remind yourself that if you do the appropriate things for your immune system, and don't overthink. One of the things that happened to me when I got sick, guys, because they couldn't figure it out at first. They just, even with the, the violent reaction, allergic reaction to the augmentin that I had, that is rooted mostly in 
potential. And it makes sense because that's when all the problems started, but there's no certainty. So because I couldn't ascertain absolutely what was wrong, my mind started to just work overtime, work overtime. I thought I was being proactive and constantly researching what could this mean, this feeling over here. But what you do when you do that is you start to actually overwhelm your immune system further because it operates unconsciously. It doesn't need you to overwhelm it with your conscious worrying. It's counterproductive is what I'm saying. So remind yourself that if you just do the appropriate things, try to love, try to make time for happiness. Don't get, I mean, stress is a part of life, sure. But do your best to minimize the stress, do daily rituals, I'm gonna go into that later, that will help to keep you feeling positive, whether it's exercise or just doing some meditation, basic breathing exercises, positive visual, visualization, and, and then your immune system will take care of the rest. It doesn't need your added input. Okay, it's evolved over thousands of years to take care of these complex tasks for you. And yeah, again, infectious diseases during the Civil War, the triumph of the quote-unquote Third Army. And over here in the study, it explains altogether two-thirds of the approximately 660,000 deaths of soldiers were caused by uncontrolled infectious diseases. And that's so important to realize, guys is they go hand in hand. And here's another study did with comrades, war and infectious diseases. And here we have also war and epidemics and chronicle of infectious diseases. All I'm saying is the media, again, they're not providing us with the proper context. Things are more complex than they appear. Right? Whenever it's, it's oversimplified in such a way that it's just, oh, you know, this evil disease came running through. And because most people don't understand how disease itself works, and it's just all of this, uh, these alarm bells of fear mongering and propaganda. If it's oversimplified like that, that's a red flag right away. We need to dissect things. We need to consider what could the other potentialities be involved here. And then the final thing that people have to also consider, and I actually became wise to this thanks to Professor Sinetra Gupta, is foreign encounters, guys. You see, during 1918, the Spanish influenza, foreign encounters and contacts were extremely rare. And the significance of this is when new populations encounter each other for the first time, especially under very stressful conditions when your immune system is already compromised, they are much more susceptible to getting a fatal reaction to a foreign pathogen or a disease. Whereas today, International travel is very common, so we are all constantly swapping bacteria. And as I explained earlier, the way that we overcome COVID-19 or any other disease or flu is that we get some of that bacteria, we get a slight infection, and our immune system learns how to fight off that infection. And this makes us immune. This allows us to uh, develop some kind of defense against it. That's how intelligent the immune system works. But back then they couldn't do that because they encountered each other for the first time at a very large scale. So it's like a tidal wave just coming crashing down on everybody. Whereas we're living in a world now where travel is common, international travel is common. We are all swapping bacteria all the time. And the person that made me wise to this was actually Professor Sinetra Gupta. As you can see in this article of the... Uh, Lockdown and social distancing could make our immune system weaker, says scientist. And she explained that people are not exposed to germs and so do not develop defenses that could protect them against future pandemics. And that's so important for people to understand, guys. And quoting over she explained that remaining in a state of lockdown is extremely dangerous from the point of view of the vulnerability of the entire population to new pathogens. Effectively, we used to live in a state approximating lockdown 100 years ago. And that was what created the conditions for the Spanish flu to come in and kill 50 million people. And unfortunately, the media hasn't given her the appropriate platform. Um, but she makes a really good case, guys. In fact, if you look in history, similar scenarios have emerged, right? When Christopher Columbus allegedly discovered the New World, the same thing happened. And there are other implications behind that because while on the one side of the fence it's perceived and it's been documented because history is written by the victors that you know it was this new discovery on the other side of that for the native americans it was 
more like an invasion. It was a war. And again, war and disease go closely hand in hand. But still, when you encounter people who have foreign diseases, foreign bacteria for the very first time, and it's also under horrible circumstances such as an invasion, then that population, now that they have their immune system compromised, are much more likely to, to get very fatally ill and sick. And the same thing here with Australia. So it's, it's very important to consider the other implications that the media is not helping to provide us context with. There's so many things, guys. So as you can see, it's outrageous. It's, it's just ridiculous, mind-numbingly stupid to make this comparison constantly with the Spanish flu, which they are not providing us the appropriate context on, and then COVID-19 of today. Totally ridiculous.